So my name is Greg Rice. Um, I'm here today to present uh, secure isolation uh, with using Docker. Uh, it looks like we don't have many people in the room. That's okay. I kind of knew this was going to happen. When you're presenting defensive security versus uh, someone in the other track presenting offense, you tend to know that uh, the other person probably has the sexier talk. But that's okay. Uh, and, and truthfully, my experience has been not many people know what Docker is yet, uh, since it's still relatively new. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Docker today uh, and set the stage for uh, you know, how you can actually be using it uh, within your enterprise. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name's Greg Rice. I work as a Principal Cybersecurity Engineer. That's my official job title. Uh, principal really just means um, I spend less of my time actually within an IDE today and more of my time within Word and, and PowerPoint trying to convince people of my ideas so that they give me money. Uh, um, my focus in my job is in research and development. So unlike some of the people here today that are really in the trenches and, and doing real security work, uh, going out, performing incident response, doing malware analysis, securing networks, uh, uh, administering firewalls, I'm more focused on the creation of new security technologies. So my focus is uh, particularly in embedded systems. Uh, my, my interests are uh, in critical systems uh, that are employed in the, in the Internet of Things, where those systems are either legacy and now just being connected to the Internet, or secondly, uh, they may be systems that are going to, to come out of the factory and be deployed out in a, uh, a real world environment for 25 or 30 years, right? We don't really have the option to be able to quickly deploy patches to these. So these are hard research problems uh, that I, I like to tackle. Today I maintain several patents on security technologies. I enjoy the work I do, but I like coming to conferences like this where I, I meet a lot more people uh, uh, who are focused on the day-to-day -day security and, not, and not, uh, uh, don't get focused on uh, academic uh, security discussions. So the focus of my talk today, again, is Docker. A little bit of this will be Docker 101. In other words, we, I want to be able to set the stage for what is Docker and how can we use it. Uh, secondly, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, Docker, using Docker for resource isolation, using Docker to the advantage of security on your systems. Uh, third, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how I leverage uh, Docker uh, sort of as a hacker, as uh, being able to, to uh, leverage some of the Docker repositories and be able to quickly set up development environments that I can leverage. So what is Docker? Well, it's an open platform, uh, open source platform for deployment and management of containerized software services. It really consists of two parts. One is the, the actual Docker engine. This is my runtime daemon uh, allowing me to, uh, to provide a framework for bringing up and executing containers and being able to manage those containers. Secondly, it is a hub or a repository for vetted containers within the community that I can quickly pull and be able to get up and, and, and working. Uh, so you'll notice today I, I mentioned uh, uh, Docker Hub is really just a cloud repository of ready to use containers. So think of this as sort of like uh, um, uh, just pulling from, from uh, GitHub, right? I find a software package on GitHub I like, I can pull it down, I can be up and running with it very quickly, or like uh, AppGet, right? Uh, if you're, uh, uh, you work in the uh, Debian, in, uh, Debian environments, AppGet is a really convenient means of quickly pulling down a package and having it up and running on your Linux distribution very quickly. So when I say containers today, what I'm really talking about are Docker containers. A Docker container is largely built on uh, um, libcontainer, a containerization technology uh, built by Google around 2007 or so. A container is really just a lightweight virtualization environment, right? We normally talk, when we talk about VMs today, we're, we're thinking about things, big, beefy virtual machines, right? Entire operating system images that I'm going to run on top of a hypervisor. But a container is really just a, a lightweight virtualization. 
But it allows me a lot of uh, uh, additional security uh, here because I'm allowed to be able to start to restrict what sort of resources are available for that container. So this includes things like what's uh, uh, my available CPU bandwidth, uh, what is my uh, uh, maximum memory limit for this system, what network interfaces are available for it, uh, what software is going to, to run within uh, this container. And I do that uh, in Docker largely through, as I mentioned before, libcontainer and control groups or C groups and Linux namespaces. Control groups are what allow me to actually limit uh, uh, the resources to a container. Namespaces uh, within Linux are what allow me to essentially allow one container to talk to another. In other words, it allows me to define that interface between containers. That is to say, I could bring up one virtualized container that operates uh, um, a, SQL, a SQL server and another virtualized container uh, that operates something like Apache, right? If I'm starting to create an environment where I want to be able to run a, uh, something like a LAMP server. So this should, should sound pretty familiar, right? The last, uh, Jared just presented on um, uh, sandboxing technology. Things like jails have been around for a long time. Uh, uh, Chirrut was very popular, particularly in the, the early and mid-2000s. Uh, LXC or Linux containers uh, have been around for a long time. In fact, Docker was originally built on uh, Linux containers. Uh, today it's, as I mentioned, built on libcontainer, the technology developed by Google. It's existed in the Solaris environment, if you're familiar with zones on Solaris. Containers are, are, are very similar, right? This technology's been around for a while in that sense. But what I like about containers is that they're very lightweight. Again, with a, when I virtualize an entire VM, I'm virtualizing, in this case, an entire guest operating system, right? And we've seen this again and, and again and again in today's demos, right? All of us are, are essentially uh, um, uh, code hackers, right? We, we uh, want to bring up development environments where we can try new tools. So, for example, that may be uh, running uh, 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 several versions of uh, Kali Linux, old versions of Backtrack. I may want to be able to quickly bring up an environment where uh, 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 a Ubuntu environment or a Red Hat environment if I'm, if I'm doing some initial testing and uh, want to create an environment where I can start to, uh, to poke around and, and start to run some of my tests. All of that's very easy to bring up as VMs. But a VM, that's a lot of overhead, right? I have a hypervisor running now. I have to, I have to virtualize that entire uh, guest OS infrastructure, whereas in the Docker world, all I really care about is a particular service, a software service that I'm running. So that could be something as simple as, uh, uh, let's say, uh, running Apache. Um, um, or I'll give you uh, an, an example recently of a case where I brought up Docker to try something. Uh, the CDC, if you've taken part in it at the Iowa State University, the cyber defense competition there every year, uh, distributes uh, essentially a web application to all of the, the red team. So you have the code to, to run uh, in advance of the event and start to poke around for web application vulnerabilities. But every semester, that seems like that, that web application changes dramatically. So sometimes it's just a PHP uh, uh, web page. Uh, this past time, uh, it was entirely written in Django. And I get that as a, as a hacker, and I'm like, well, man, I don't know anything about Django. All right, I, I'm willing to learn, right? I love learning new things. I'll go off and I'll start to learn about this. But man, I got to get up in a Django environment now. What about after this competition? I don't want that sitting around and running. Uh, so, you know, I, it, it could be something where I'd spin up a VM, put it all in the VM, and uh, uh, once, I'm, once, once it's over and I'm finished testing, I blow away the VM. But again, that's a lot of overhead. I got to wait for that VM to boot. I have to uh, make sure that I, I have all of the dependencies within that environment. Uh, I have to get Django up and running within that VM. That's, that takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, it takes a lot of computing time. I'd like something much more lightweight. So this is where containers become so useful because I still have the isolation of a virtual machine I still largely have that isolation, but I'm only concerned with virtualizing 
just the service that I want to run. Now, you might argue that, uh, in this case, you're not, you don't have quite the same security, and, and I would acknowledge that, right? There are certain sh shared resources within a containerized environment that are shared. So, for example, I point out a few here. Uh, those include things like uh, Proxys, ProcIRQ, uh, some of the, uh, the dev devices, like some of the uh, uh, dev SD devices are shared. Low-level kernel functionality shared across the VMs, right? You're, you're essentially, you're running on top of the kernel. So some of that is shared as well. So for things like uh, uh, um, any of your Linux drivers, your LSM modules, all of that is shared. So technically, if you had a very low-level kernel exploit, uh, uh, this is something where you could break out of your container. But again, it's, it's really not about uh, um, uh, low-level kernel exploits here. Really what you want to be able to do is bring up uh, uh, quick environments uh, where you have virtualized services, and you want to bring those up in a default and minimized state. <clears throat> so Docker hasn't been around for that long. In fact, when I talk to people today about Docker, they've either heard of it and uh, uh, they're fully committed to Docker, or secondly, uh, they, they've read about it in the news, uh, they kind of know about it, but they really don't know much about it other than it's, it's a container technology. In fact, it hasn't been around very long at all, for about two years now. So in uh, January 2013, uh, DotCloud started uh, a side project uh, that wanted to start to look at new containerization solutions. Um, that migrated into an open source project that was released just a few months later uh, in March of 2013. Uh, that project was released to the public, but it started to gain a lot of steam very quickly. So fast forward to uh, uh, September of 2013, you already have many, many people using this, in fact, in production at this point, despite it being so, so relative, uh, uh, in, in relative infancy. You start to see a lot of investment into this area, uh, eventually, Dot Cloud sort of uh, sells off the rest of their business, rebrands as Docker, which brings us uh, uh, even more recently to uh, this past summer with the 1.0 release of Docker. We've seen it a lot in the news now, um, but, but many people are still kind of backing away with it, and that's largely because containers to date have been problematic. Uh, um, they historically lacked a decent infrastructure Right, if you, uh, if you worked um, in the early 2000s in security and you looked at, at starting to create services that operated within jails or uh, cheroots, um, that, that took some time, it took some configuration. Uh, uh, the containers that you created were largely matched to that particular distribution. And so this is, these are the sorts of problems that Docker wanted to, to essentially tackle. They wanted to focus on a very lightweight, standardized container that could be taken from one distribution to another, and there should be no worry from the developer on whether or not that technology would work. Likewise, they wanted to focus on that state of resource isolation, making sure that these particular uh, software services only operated within uh, their, their uh, uh, restricted environments. So today you see a broad use of, of Docker, and this is why I say it's been in the news a lot lately. Uh, Red Hat has, is probably the largest adopter of Docker today. The Amazon Clouds now supports uh, Docker containers. I no longer have to worry about spinning up, a, uh, for example, a whole VM within the Amazon Cloud. I can be a lot more lightweight. I can drop uh, Docker containers there. Google uh, has been in the news, uh, again, being the creator of the Lib Container technology that Docker is based on, uh, um, has been in the news recently for being a huge supporter of Docker. In fact, I, I have a news clipping here that says Google, uh, everything at Google runs within a container. Uh, Spotify has uh, uh, Dockerized much of their technology today. Um, uh, Microsoft is fully investing in Docker as well. I'm not quite certain what Microsoft is actually uh, strategically leveraging it for. That company's strategy is never clear to me. Like, jumping into the smartphone business? I, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, again, Docker consists largely of two things. One is the execution framework. The second is that cloud repository, or Docker hub, that I mentioned before. 
So the execution framework is where we begin to set some of the stage for managing containers. Again, to date, raw containers were always very difficult to manage. They weren't standardized. I couldn't just take them from one distribution to the other. Docker aims to tackle that problem by making deployment very, very easy. So what I really like about Docker, and the reason that I first started to, uh, to start to use it, uh, I had this, this problem of portability. I was working on a major program where we had maybe uh, 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 six different companies with 20 disjoint software services, and we needed to integrate all of them into one common solution. Each of our services were providing an integral part of that system, but you know, somebody's running on uh, um, uh, Fedora, another person's running on uh, an old version of Debian, another person's running on BSD, right? We have all of these different services, all of these different dependencies, and we just need to start to bring them together into one rack. And so the practical way to do that at the time was just to spin up lots and lots and lots of VMs. So I can remember heading out uh, to the, uh, one of the first integration exercises, and I brought tons and tons of disks with me because all I was bringing were lots of VMs, VMs where I was focused on, on bringing up and making sure that I had environments with all of my dependencies built in. And this is really no different from uh, 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 within the security arena, especially as you think about supporting multiple uh, different deployments, right? You have your uh, um, uh, a cluster maybe for developers, you have uh, um, uh, uh, a backup recovery site where you want to be able to quickly uh, uh, deploy to in the case of a major incident, right? All of these things, they tend to use different hardware, they have different dependencies, and so we end up with a lot of distributions that we have to manage over time. And this becomes particularly problematic uh, not only to manage functionally but in security as well. If I have lots and lots of different OS distributions, uh, VMs that I'm operating, right, there's a lot of overhead in terms of patch management, making sure that those are adequately backed up and are snapshotted over time. There's a lot of different types of operating systems that I have to, uh, to, to manage. Uh, I'm starting to, to worry about some of the real resource requirements as well, right? VMs are very heavy. And that's what we drove into on this, on this particular program. We had rack after rack after rack where we're just wasting large quantities of, uh, of computing power on virtualizing entire OSs. So our focus there was, well, we wanted something that was more standardized and uh, um, uh, someone offered the idea of, hey, I've read about Docker in the news, maybe we should check it out. And so that was kind of what initially sparked my, uh, 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 my interest in this area. Docker, as, I'm, as I've kind of alluded to, Docker, its, its name extends from this idea of shipping containers, right? A shipping container standardized. I can take a container off of ship. I can plop it on a rail car. I can put it on a, uh, a, a truck, right? That shipping container can go anywhere. I don't have to worry about the platform that's transporting that shipping container. I merely need to track that shipping container and where it's at uh, and fill it with good things. And so Docker takes that model, takes that analogy, and starts to package up software services within these containers such that I can put them anywhere. If it runs Linux, it can run a Docker container. As long as that container is of the same instruction set architecture as, uh, uh, um, as the, uh, the executing framework. By that, what I mean is I can't take a PowerPoint, or excuse me, a PowerPC uh, uh, container and run it on an ARM processor. I obviously can't take an Intel container and run it on an ARM processor, right? I have to, I have to pay attention to the, the, the low-level machine uh, architecture, but I don't have to worry about, oh, you're on uh, Ubuntu 12, I'm on 14, oh, um, I can't run this particular version of Hadoop there because of these dependency issues, it's unstable, right? I containerize things, the rest, the rest is all easy. I don't have to worry about uh, uh, anything else. And this, this is what I, I love about uh, uh, Docker, uh, even more than the, the, the security aspect. Container management's very easy. What I do is basically set up a little bit of uh, metadata that describes things like, um, uh, do I want to open up ports on this pota uh, particular container? What are its dependencies? Does it depend on any other containers that I have operating? I gave the example of a LAMP server. 
I can create containers where I run one Apache in one container. I may run uh, MySQL in another. Uh, I could run uh, Postgres in another. Um, um, uh, uh, Django in a completely other container. Right? I have the ability there to separate things and then uh, start to identify the minimal, um, uh, minimal communication uh, mechanisms between these containers. So I bundle everything up, and now I have a very lightweight, small container, and I'm able to, to run that anywhere that, uh, that has the Docker daemon running. So all I need today to get uh, Docker up and running really uh, is just uh, to, to pull the, uh, the Docker uh, this Docker execution framework and get it up and running on my box. After that, things are very, very easy to start and stop containers. <clears throat> uh, launching a container is relatively easy. There is uh, the Docker execution framework not only consists of the daemon, but a command line utility that allows me to start and stop uh, things very easily. Uh, all of the Docker daemons uh, listen on a uh, um, a Unix socket by default, I can actually configure that uh, within production environments to listen to a TCP socket so I can actually issue all of these commands uh, remotely as well. It's very, the, easy, the API uh, is a bit, uh, has a bit of a learning curve, but more recently, as we'll see later, Docker's uh, purchased a company uh, called Orchard that had a technology called Fig uh, that largely focused on this idea of how do I quickly and easily configure Docker containers. Uh, so this has actually become significantly easier over time. So with that in mind, the Docker execution framework uh, is relatively straightforward and easy today. Uh, we'll see a, a demo here uh, in, in a few minutes where we actually start to look at examples of that execution framework. So I mentioned Docker consists of two parts. One is the execution framework. Again, the second is uh, the Docker hub. The Docker hub is essentially my um, way of being able to manage different containers. In particular, the public Docker hub, or the public Docker repo, allows me to quickly pool containers that are pre-configured and vetted by the community to be secure uh, um, uh, so I can quickly pull those containers and get them up and running in my environment. That's very useful as a developer. Uh, um, I gave the example before of, of bringing up a, a CDC web server and, and discovering, oh, this uses Django. I don't have that installed. And I, I don't want to have to worry about, uh, for example, if somebody gives me something to pen test and it runs MySQL, uh, I don't want to have to worry about, all right, well, I've got to get this MySQL database set up. And I want to make sure that uh, I, you know, uh, I'm a security person, so I tend to be anal. If I'm going to bring up MySQL on a particular box, I want to make it to be, I want to make sure that it's secure, even though I'm going to uh, uh, be poking around their web app as part, of this, uh, as part of this pen test. And when I'm done with it, I, since I'm not using it anymore as a developer, I want it out of there. I, I don't want to have to worry about all of that. And that's what makes Docker container management, uh, they've made that exceptionally easy. What I do as a developer today, when someone gives me uh, uh, new requirements, I can quickly, on my, on my, uh, uh, within my development environment, go out and pull a container image from the Docker repo. And the best part about this is that it's really not unlike at, uh, apt-get in the sense that I could pull something and it will figure out dependencies based on the image I'm pulling. I can even pull an entire uh, uh, base operating system images within container environments. So you can pull, for example, a, a virtualized uh, uh, Ubuntu image uh, today, uh, a virtualized uh, 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 Fedora image, all from this environment, and be able to be quickly up and running right away. Once I do that as a developer, now I can start to, uh, to add my applications on top of that. So for example, let's say I was to, uh, 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 in my example earlier of the, the CDC website, it's running Django. So I'm going to pull two, probably two containers from the Docker public registry. The first one's going to be the Django container. The second one, I'm probably, Django, uh, if you're not familiar with it, really is just a, uh, a framework for uh, uh, doing 
web design in conjunction with a SQL Server, so I'm probably going to have to pull a SQL Server container as well. I pull both of those. Now I can start adding my, ex, uh, my proprietary content to those containers. So this, in my case, in my example, I just want to run the CDC web server. So I put that on top. I can add some uh, uh, metadata around that. In other words, how I want, want that website to, uh, to auto, auto run each time I launch this container. Uh, maybe I, I set up some configuration settings around it. But at that point now, I can, if I wanted to share it, I can push it to our own internal Docker registry. You'll notice here I'm using the terms push and pull. When I say Docker registry, what I'm really referring to here uh, is essentially a get repo of container images. Now, all of, well, once, once I have that internal repository, any of the environments that I operate in can easily just pull from that environment and as long as that environment is running uh, uh, Linux or has uh, uh, some variant of Docker, for example, you can run, you can run this on uh, OS X, um, they're able to uh, uh, quickly up, get that container up and running. It's as easy as a, as a get pool, uh, assuming that they're running the Docker daemon. So this gives me a lot of flexibility now. I don't have to worry so much about dependencies, right? When I started, uh, uh, I can remember especially developing like web applications in the late 90s and, and really web hosting providers at the time just weren't ready for dynamic, uh, 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 dynamic content on board the web yet. You know, you'd spend a lot of time on, 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 the, on the help desk with, with different individuals because what they really wanted to do, the only thing that they were configured for at the time was hosting static HTML, but trying to get uh, work with web hosters at the time uh, uh, to, to run things like Perl um, on the website, uh, that, was, that was a difficult issue and you had to walk people through all of these dependencies. Now this is very simple. The same thing I can do in a, a cloud environment like Amazon, right? I can, I can uh, uh, pull directly from uh, my, my container registry, pull a container into the Amazon cloud and get that up and running very quickly. <clears throat> So it's worth talking a little bit about how to build containers. Containers are composed of a baseline image. So this can be large or small. For example, I could pull something like, let's say, uh, I just wanted to be able to operate PHP. I can pull a small image that simply gives me uh, PHP, uh, 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 the ability to execute PHP. And so there's probably at least some base around that. Sometimes that's uh, a, a bit of a, uh, a baseline file system. Uh, I can pull complete baseline operating system images, like for example, I give the, uh, in my sample here, I have Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux operating as my baseline image. I can then add services on top of that container. Uh, for example, I may want to run uh, uh, Apache or something. And my, finally, I can add my application on top of that container. But what's nice about this is that I can pull these standardized vetted containers, again, from the, 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 the public Docker repo. That gets me up and running very quickly. The other thing I really like about uh, uh, Docker uh, from a, a configuration management perspective is the ability to quickly uh, 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 do revision control here. In my earlier example where I'm tr uh, I have everything hosted as VMs, once I'm done with that VM, I, I, uh, I take it down, I can, I can image it again, I put it back on uh, my hardware at home, and I start making changes. The next, the next uh, uh, integration event I might go to, now I've got to take that, take that whole VM with me again, right? I'm always, I'm always concerned uh, with uh, um, uh, the revision over snapshots, so I, I tend to be pulling these large images. Whereas Docker has a nice environment where you're only really pushing just the modification to these containers. So you'll see in, in, in the graphic here, what I have is a, a container in the top left corner. I make a modification uh, or two to that container, push it to my, whatever my, my container repository is. Now, when, out in the field within my development environments, I can quickly pull those, uh, just those small modifications and get those up and running within my environment uh, without having to move around a whole lot of uh, 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 container data. 
So advantages of Docker, particularly from a security perspective, one, it's very minimal, right? These containers, the baseline images, they operate ex exclusively what uh, uh, you want them to, right? If I pull uh, a, uh, um, a, an image today, let's say if I, I pull something like uh, Apache, I can define there the version of Apache that I want to run, any, uh, um, uh, but when I pull it, it's going to run just Apache. If I want to run something additional, I have to define that as part of my metadata, right? If there's an Apache module that I want to run, I have to define that as part of my metadata. They're very portable, easy to share. Uh, uh, what I really like is uh, they have uh, uh, a strong separation of privileges. All of the, this is relatively new, but all of the images are now being vetted by the community to make sure that they don't have uh, any sort of malicious content, that they're set up uh, as secure by default. You have, with, within these environments, as I've pointed out before, you have a strong isolation as well, right? If I take the time uh, to make sure that my containers are set up with minimal resources, any isolation that I have of that particular application, it tends to be uh, uh, limited to that containerized environment. Um, it's very fast to quickly deploy uh, uh, within the Docker environment, right? I'm not so much worried about dependencies here. Docker takes care of all of that uh, uh, automatically for me. There's complete environments now, uh, uh, new, new systems based on uh, Docker that allow you to uh, uh, that focus on this deployment problem. So for example, Go CD, uh, Go Continuous Deployment, is a complete framework for quickly being able to test images within a development framework and then uh, once, they, once they, you've gotten them through security and regression testing, quickly pushing those uh, out, to, uh, uh, out to production. Uh, there's other frameworks that manage containers for you, uh, allow you to see images over time, make sure that you have uh, your baseline image uh, contains everything that, uh, uh, that you need. <clears throat> so let's, let's get a little bit uh, uh, more detailed. Uh, uh, so that we can do the demo here. Remember I mentioned before that any container contains a baseline image. These are baseline uh, vetted images that I pull from the Docker Hub. So in this case, I have from Dockerfile Tomcat uh, uh, app server, right? So that's kind of my, my baseline image that I, I want to be able to pull. This is, uh, I, I want to be able to uh, operate a Tomcat server within this environment. I add the uh, uh, web apps on top of that that I want to, uh, uh, want to be able to execute. So, right, I start with a baseline image that I'm assured has some security. Now I add uh, my, ex uh, my application on top of that. So in this case, I say add uh, mywebapp.war. And now I can start exposing things from that container, right? By default, none of the ports on that container are exposed, right? It's just, it just brings a Tomcat server up and it's running within that, that uh, virtualized file system. It's running within that container environment. But ideally, I'd like to start exposing some things, right? Uh, a web server is not much useful, uh, not very useful to me unless I can actually access it over a TCP port. So here I expose eight, port 8080. What that essentially means is for this container, expose port 8080, and in fact, I don't show it here, but you can actually map that then to a, con a port that's open on the, the host operating system as well. So in this case, what I might do, try to do is do an expose 8080 colon 8080. So that means I expose port 8080 uh, um, on the container and have that open on my base operating system as well. This idea of exposing allows me to quickly configure how individual containers will talk to one another over uh, uh, ports. And I can give it some initial commands to, uh, to, to start processes within this container. So in my case, um, uh, I have a, a simple uh, uh, service kickoff and uh, um, uh, start uh, the, the logging process. Now, as I mentioned before, Really, uh, when, when Docker first uh, arrived on the scene, it wasn't particularly user-friendly. It had an environment that was largely command line driven. You could do a lot within that environment, but it took you, if you go through the Docker documentation, it all still exists today. There are a ton of command line options. It's sort of like tackling Nmap for the first time, right? Nmap has a ton of command line options. 
it's hard to, to wrap all your mind around all of them uh, uh, quickly. But fortunately, uh, uh, there are environments today that make that very easy. So today, uh, um, Fig has been uh, integrated into Docker. Uh, it, we call it now Docker Compose. Essentially, what we, what we do is set up an environment, define what we want our environment to look like within a YAML file, and we can use that to quickly deploy multiple containers uh, for Docker, all using this, this fig environment or Docker Compose. So this makes things very easy. So let me give you an example here of a, a YAML file uh, for, uh, for Docker Compose. So you'll notice here I have two, uh, um, two particular operating system images. Can we make this bigger, I wonder? Is that helpful? Um, so I have two images. The first is the database image. So I define it as being named DB, the second one being the web image. I, I call it, of course, web. My database image is going to be based on the baseline image for Postgres. Notice in this case, I, don't get, I, I could give it a version. I don't, so by default, it's going to be the most current. What I'm saying here is, I, hey, Docker, I want you to go out to the Docker Hub, to your public Docker repository, and if I don't already have it, grab the most up-to-date image for Postgres. And within this database environment, I can set some uh, environment variables. I set two silly, silly ones here, um, uh, just the username and password, a username of Postgres, password, blah, blah. I can set lots of, the, I, I'm showing a very simplistic example. I can set lots of environment variables here. For example, default database name and so on. My second container is going to be uh, a, a, a web environment. Uh, um, the important thing to note here is that I set up a virtual file system. So in this case, I'm putting everything in web. So if you're familiar with jails and, and how we limit uh, uh, file systems within jails, here I, I, I mount things on web, right? I'm limited to this environment, this mount for web. I want my web environment here uh, to operate a Django server. Uh, it's going to, uh, so if you're familiar with Django, basically Django is based in Python, so I call Python manage.py. I'm going to run a Django server. I'm going to run it on the local host on port 8000. That means that I need to open port 8000 on the container as well. And here I map port 8000 to port 8000 on the local host. That means anyone connecting on the local host to port 8000 is passed directly to that container. Here I'm starting to uh, build on top of this concept of namespaces. I want to be able to link these containers in some way, right? I've isolated my web container. It operates within one Docker container. But I want it, right, it's a Django environment, it needs to be able to pull ideally from a, a, a SQL database. I want it to be linked uh, and dependent upon a, uh, a, a different container. In this case, I'm describing this link to be my database container. The database uh, is defined here. So that is to say, now if I launch the web container, I, the web container will automatically launch then the database container uh, to be able to actually uh, operate within this, within this framework. Again, the important thing to, to remember here from a security perspective, though, is that each of these operate within an individual container. There's a zero day discovered tomorrow for uh, Postgres, right? And someone uh, was to, uh, 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 let's say, somehow, I, I haven't really exposed anything here, so maybe this is a bad example. But if someone was to say, let's, let's say, uh, um, uh, compromise uh, um, uh, Postgres because I, I, I exposed something more than I should have, right? They're limited, their attack is limited to that environment, right? Breaking out of that container uh, is going to require uh, potentially a, a low-level exploit. Oops. So let's switch over to a demo then. What I want to do in this demo is really demonstrate the two features of Docker. So in one case, what I'm going to do is do a, a simple 
uh, pull from the Docker public repository to get a, a full image up and running. In this case, it's going to be a simple image. Uh, um, uh, I'm just going to run a, uh, a simple application, the Hello World application, right, what we're all familiar with as, as software developers. But I'm going to run that on top of uh, a, a Ubuntu baseline image. My second case is the, uh, the, the one that I've mentioned here before. I want to operate Django and SQL within uh, both container environments. So let's kick off. Um, I wonder if I can make this bigger, easier. No. All right, so what I'm going to do here, uh, it, actually, let's do this. If I say Docker images, this will show the images that I presently have installed. So the first one here is a Python image. Uh, notice here, I'm not running the latest instance of Python. Uh, I, I, I truthfully don't know many people that actually program in Python 3.x. Uh, uh, so I'm running Python 2.7. I have a, a Postgres container as well. So here are my Docker images. These are things that I've pulled from the repository. There's one more at the top. That's one that I've built, dockertest.web, uh, for this particular demo. And you can see their virtual size there on the, on the right um, and the time when they were created. So this isn't the time, it's important to point out here, this isn't the time that uh, when I created them on my system, this is the time that they were created on the Docker Hub repository. So Python, uh, 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 the, the Python image was last updated uh, with uh, system updates two weeks ago. Same thing goes for, uh, for Postgres. Um, I want to be able to run Hello World. And so to do that, what I'm going to do, if I switch over to my other tab here, uh, I'm going to uh, 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 create a command, say docker run. In this case, and this is, this is, this is what I really love about Docker, right? I'm just going to say, I, don't, I haven't done anything else yet. I'm just going to say docker run. I'm going to tell it what I want it to run. In this case, I want a containerized image of uh, baseline Ubuntu 14.04. And I'm going to, uh, uh, once you bring up that baseline image, what I want you to do is just echo hello world. So I'm going to kick this off. Remember though, I don't have an image for Ubuntu 14.04. So what happens then, it says, well, I can't find it. So I'm going to go out and get it. Uh, so at this point, it's downloading an image. And it's a big image, so let's, let's switch gears. We'll come back to it in a minute. Well, let's switch gears, and uh, uh, we'll come back and, and check on that. No, it's not. But <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to do comedy. Well, here you have a question. All right. So this is running on your laptop with yep. the Docker service installed. Yep. So that's important to note. Like, so for example, uh, uh, this laptop uh, I bought off of eBay used. Uh, five years ago. Normally the laptops I use, um, I just use ones for work. This is a, a presentation that I'm personally doing, so I brought my personal laptop. Um, old laptop. Uh, it's a, a, a uh, Core 2 Duo, not much RAM. The thought of running a VM on this laptop would scare me. Uh, at this point the laptop's probably on the order of like seven, I mean, I don't know, seven, eight years old. It's not very beefy. And you'll notice any of the speakers today, when they switch to VMs, particularly like uh, I'll pick on uh, uh, Andrew this morning, he tried to, uh, to switch uh, from his base operating system, OS X, uh, to a, a Fedora core image. And his demo, particularly early on, was very slow because really, you know, a laptop, right, even a new laptop doesn't have a whole lot of processing power for a complete uh, virtual machine infrastructure. Um, uh, did I switch? Oh, yeah, I did. Let's see how this is doing. Oh, it did actually download now. Uh, so that downloaded uh, Ubuntu and did its thing. It ran Hello World, uh, um, right? All within a few minutes. I brought up an entire environment, a baseline Ubuntu image, without having to go through a process of spinning up a VM and letting that for that to boot. 
uh, installing from the baseline image, uh, let's say I'm booting up the VM off of a, uh, uh, a standard ISO disk, then I have to go through the process of installing, now I have to uh, uh, eventually uh, go through the app get update. All of that's been done for me. I've pulled the most recent app get updated Ubuntu image from, doc, uh, from the Docker repository online, and I've run my command. And I can make this more interactive. Uh, so now if I do like uh, uh, Docker images, all right, well I see that uh, I'm, I have uh, Ubuntu installed now. It, it's tagged as a, a number of different things, such as 1404, 1404-2, or latest. Uh, trusty, so they've tagged it here as a number of different things, but it's really all the same image here. You notice if, you, if I look at the image ID, all of these point essentially to the same thing. And it's relatively small. I can actually make, and this is, this is useful to me when I'm debugging applications that are running on top of a Docker container, I can make this more interactive as well. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is say Docker run, same command as before, um, only in this case, I'm going to open up, I want this to be interactive. I'm going to open up and run a, uh, I, I'm essentially going to run a terminal. So instead of running echo hello world, I'm going to open up a bash prompt. And in this case, I've set this up uh, with the commands such that we open up, oops, a root prompt. So notice there, boom, I'm up and running right away, right? I don't have to pay that penalty anymore of downloading an image. I'm up and running within that environment in a shell right away. And so now I can start to, uh, to poke around here and I have a, 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 full, a full up, uh, essentially since I'm, I'm running a baseline Ubuntu image, I have a full essentially containerized image of Ubuntu. So let's exit out of that. All right, so let's do one last thing and that is, yes. Very easily, exceptionally easily. So, uh, in this case now, right, I have I have now four images: my Ubuntu image, my Postgres image, my Python image, Docker test web. Let's get rid of Docker test web and build it from scratch. So, uh, I'm gonna remove what is it? D6. You can also just give the name. Oops, I probably I'm still running something. Uh, so let's do, probably have it in my history somewhere. Yeah, there we go. I'll stop the images I'm running. Oh, come on. Oops. if I spell it correctly. All right, let's get rid of stuff, and I'm going to get rid of that one container. All right, so now if I do a Docker images, I should see I'm just down to Postgres, Python, Ubuntu. And the question uh, uh, for those of you on the video recording is can I quickly layer things on top of it? So in this case, I have, I've already pulled two images. One just a Python image. All I can do there is run Python code. The other one, just a Postgres database. All I can do there is operate a database. Uh, but I want to be able to quickly layer things on top of this. So enter my uh, YAML file again. This is the one I, I had earlier. Uh, uh, let's start out with the YAML file, then we'll look at the Docker file and my requirements file. So in my YAML file, I have a data, I, I create an image here called database. It's going to be based on Postgres. Uh, and I'm going to set up some environment variables. Again, I have a second image. It's going to be called web. This is the one that I'm building. It's linked or based on this database image. And notice here, I call out a command Python. So Docker now knows that, well, OK, uh, uh, I said, we're essentially going to need Python within this environment. I can uh, uh, contrast that with my Docker file. Maybe I should have started with this one. Within my Docker file, I notice that I'm going to start, I'm going to create my new image 
from the Python 2.7 image. I could set environment variables, but what I really want to do is set up my virtual file system within that, that image. So I'm going to make a directory here called web. I'm going to set that as my virtual file system. I'm going to add a file within this directory called requirements.txt to web. And now I can, this run command essentially allows me to run particular Linux commands within that container. So notice the first thing I did was make a virtual file system, uh, make a, a folder, set that as my, uh, uh, essentially my, my work folder, my, uh, uh, my uh, essentially uh, uh, root file system. I'm going to add within this container requirements.txt, and then I'm going to do a Python install uh, uh, to require, of requirements.txt there. So let's look at requirements.txt. We'll talk about that. What I do for requirements.txt, right, my baseline Python image is just Python. I don't have any of the, uh, uh, like any of the PyPy modules that, that I might want as part of my baseline Python install. But I'm running Django, so I'm going to need Django. Uh, uh, and in this case, I add an, an, another module. So what I have at this point is a Docker file that says, create an image from, called Py, uh, 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 from Python, uh, create this uh, 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 virtual file system, and install these additional Python modules within that environment. My fig environment, now I start to, to build on top of that image. So here, I set my, uh, my build environment as dot, so that's just going to look at that Docker file. Here's the command I want it to run once that container's launched, so I'm going to actually open up my Django uh, interface. Here's the volume that I want to mount. I point it to the same thing that we had before, that's the web. I'm going to open up one port, and I want this to be based on uh, the database as well, uh, that particular image. So now, with Compose, oops, with Compose, <clears throat> what I can do now is kick this off, and we can actually create, uh, um, so I'm going to start Docker Compose, right, I, I've, I've been using Docker Compose and Fig in, interchangeably. Docker Compose is my, uh, my Fig environment. What I want this to do is run the web image, so it's going to have to build that first. And what I initially wanted to do is just kick off that, that baseline Django framework. If you're familiar with Django, basically what I'm doing here is saying, create a default website within whatever volume that I mount you in, in this case, web. So I'll kick this off. Now notice the first thing it did here is said, I need Python. Python was already there. I wasn't going to uh, wait for us to download. I set up an environment variable within Python. So I, I modified the image slightly, created a directory called web, uh, set that as my uh, default uh, working directory. Now I added that requirements file. Now I'm installing all of those Python uh, modules within that environment. So I've installed one, now I've installed Django. All right, I've successfully built this. Oh, I forgot to uh, delete something first. That's probably okay though. Let's do that again. I forgot to clean up you know, you always do these things where it's like, I'm going to test this so many times. And I did, so I tested it. Oops. But what I forgot to do is clean up my prior test. So let's remove that, and we'll remove manage. Yes. So all I've done right now, what I just did was remove the default Django website that I told it to install because it started to build it and the last thing it did was start to run that command to build the default Django website and it said I can't do it. So I'm just gonna, uh, 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 the other thing we should do here, oops, is go ahead and pull that container, oops. We'll build it from scratch again since it's so fast. If I can type. So I've been typing the ID before. You can also just type the name, Docker Test Web. That'll pull it. All right, let's try again. 
So grab that environment, start building on top of the environment. Now I'm going to install those Python modules. The first one I download is Django. Second one I download uh, is Psycho uh, PG. I'm uh, running the, uh, the setup now for Psycho PG, so I'm building that container. So you'll notice here, it's, it's, this is what I really, I, I continue to stress this, this is what I really love about it, is that I'm up and running within a framework that I want for my penetration test very quickly. So now I've successfully built my container. Docker Compose, or FIG, makes this launching that container exceptionally easy. If you look in my environment now, I have that Docker uh, file and Docker Compose.yaml. Docker Compose, sort of like a, a make file. Um, if I call Docker Compose uh, run, uh, this will essentially run the Docker Compose file within this directory. So I'll say Docker Compose run, oops. Uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, so it's uh, start. I always type wrong. All right, so the first thing that does is bring up my database. Remember the database uh, uh, um, is what I have to, is, is what I base my link on. Now I start the other container, web. So my database uh, comes up. You'll notice it's just called database one at this point. Uh, database uh, uh, um, automatically started. Now my web application starts. So now if I open, remember I mapped my container to port 8000 on, uh, uh, on my PC on my laptop. So now if I go to localhost port 8000, I should, yep, get, here's my default Django web page now. It used to be when I did a pen test, I would spend a lot of time creating baseline operating systems, installing VMs, trying to match my environment. Uh, if I wanted to, if I had source, I'd want to get that source up and running so that I could internally play with it. You don't have to do that anymore. There's no reason uh, uh, to, to spend as much time as we do building up these large uh, virtual uh, operating system infrastructures when things are so neatly containerized with Docker. That's why this technology is catching on so fast. Uh, again, you know, I've spent you know, the past, I don't know, a uh, few months learning about Docker and, and using it for uh, projects at work when I meet people today and talk about Docker, they're either, they've either used it and they start to see the benefits and they're, they're, they fully latch onto it, or they just, they haven't yet. And so they, they, they haven't, uh, uh, um, they haven't drank the Kool-Aid. Um, Docker's been something that uh, it, I, find, I find, especially with FIG or Docker Compose, very easy to use. There's lots of online tutorials. In fact, if you go to docker.io, the main website, they have an interactive uh, uh, command line utility with little assignments that you can step through in terms of the tutorial to get up and running with Docker uh, uh, right away. Depending on the operating system that, uh, that you use, um, uh, it can be easier, easy or hard to get up and running with the Docker daemon. Uh, for example, I'm running, I run Mint on my laptop. Uh, Mint is Debian based. You can do an apt-get install of, uh, uh, of Docker it's a little old since it's Debian based, so I'd, I'd recommend pulling directly from GitHub. Um, if you're on Fedora, relatively easy to get up. You just do a, a, a yum install. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, uh, you can actually run Docker within that environment as well. I haven't played, I'm not a Mac fan, so I haven't played with that. Uh, I, can't, I can't attest to its, its maturity there. Uh, the other thing I haven't found, uh, uh, you, you can run, so, Last night at, uh, at dinner, someone asked me um, when I was telling them about this talk, uh, have, you, have you spun up containers uh, at all to try uh, to do uh, uh, malware analysis, right? Everything's containerized. And uh, um, you can actually spin up environments like Cuckoo within, within Docker containers. Um, um, typically, though, with malware analysis, uh, it, I, it's generally better to run with a virtual oper uh, complete guest virtual operating system, right? You want to be able to mirror that environment as much as possible as you're doing, uh, as, you're, as you're trying to reverse engineer a particular piece of new malware. 
this is the only the, the only thing that I haven't found it useful for as 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 a uh, as a developer. Questions at all? Yeah. Uh, so I, I see that it's got a whole bunch of controls around like inbound, you know, connections to the to the Docker. What about uh, the egress stuff? Is there is there? Oh, good question. So. I don't know, because I've never actually, I, I've been primarily using it within development environments at this point. I haven't used it in, in the case of, uh, of a full deployment so far where I, or I was concerned with uh, egress. I don't know, I'd have, to, I'd, have to, I'd have to do some research on that. That's and, a good question. And then what about, you know, like, you know, wanting to install like a HIDS, you know, inside of it, like, you know, an OSEP or something like that. What, is there support? Yeah, so there's actually, if you go out and look, look around, there's, uh, there are a ton of projects on uh, the Docker Hub. So there's actually projects where they start to look at doing things like uh, host-based intrusion detection within these containers. Um, the, the, I should just mention um, here, the other, thing, the other projects to check out within, within Docker, uh, Shipyard is a complete deployment management system. I mentioned Go CD before. Uh, Core OS is complete infrastructure based on top of, uh, uh, of Docker. They really have a lot riding on it. Uh, but there's a ton, I mean, if you look at the, the, this is a project that came out two years ago, and if you look on GitHub, it's one of the, the uh, uh, you know, top 10 most popular projects today. It has something like, the last time I checked, like 4,100, 4,100 uh, forks of it now. There's a lot of people starting to use it. And that's why I mentioned you know, you talk to people today and they either have no idea what it is or they, they've definitely, they're all on board. Uh, I don't, I've been using it now uh, uh, myself for only a few months. I, I would hardly consider myself a Docker expert yet, but in that time, it's been so easy and convenient to use to do uh, to development that it really gives uh, uh, the maturity there that they've been able to achieve in a short period of time really gives me sat satisfaction. Yeah. So have you used Vagrant? I have used Vagrant. Uh, um, if you look at, uh, um, for example, Chef would be a, another alternative to Vagrant. Um, uh, Vagrant and Chef, um, any of the other provisioning environments, are all um, uh, work seamlessly well with Docker today. Uh, a number of people have mentioned uh, Jenkins today in, a, in the other talks. Uh, Jenkins has complete support for now uh, quickly deploying Docker containers as well. Um, um, the, it's, it's very easy, you know, so for example, with, with something like Chef or Vagrant, I want to be able to spin up uh, small virtual operating systems and provision things within those virtual operating systems. Those technologies are completely amenable to Docker as well. I'm just not virtualizing an entire operating system. It's closer to uh, uh, virtualizing, uh, in my example here, right, I just wanted a Python environment up with, uh, with Django, that's all. Right, and so those environments are very amenable to this as well. Yeah. So I know that you didn't open any ports for Postgres, so it's probably running through a socket, right? Yes. So I, I want to say localhost, but I know it's not localhost. So is that socket on your laptop, or is it in the Ubuntu container? It's on my laptop. Okay. So uh, to be okay. clear, there. So this is a shared yeah, and to be clear, like I, uh, that is a completely separate container. So I was only using that just for, um, uh, just for uh, uh, the the Hello World and uh, Bash uh, example. So I could blow that container away. What's it called? Docker. Oh right. Uh, because you had the right. So I could blow this container away. Zero nine. That's right. But see, think, you know, I, I, especially as a new Docker user, I would get confused by that as well. It's like, well, I can't blow that away. That's my, my baseline operating system. Uh, so let's do Docker Compose. So I've blown away now uh, Ubuntu, right? If I do Docker Images, I should only see the three that, oops, Docker Images. Docker Test Web, that's the one we built. Python, Postgres. Uh, now I'll go and do a Docker Compose up again. I can easily launch those containers. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Um, is there any roadmap or do they have now security to drive the release? Or is it pretty much 
Yes, uh, and and I haven't really seen a strong roadmap around that per se. I mean, it's still so new, and there's so many people that are building technologies on top of it. Um, that, yeah, I can't. I I would hesitate to comment on a, a roadmap, but they make it very easy for you to be able to understand what what should my baseline image look like. How can I quickly deploy that to a development environment and set up an, an entire framework around testing it and then be able to uh, push that to uh, uh, a deployment environment as well? So for example, uh, GoCD that I mentioned before really tries to, to focus on tackling that challenge, right? But that's a separate project than Docker. If you, if you look at any of the presentations this, in this area, it's clear, I mean, people realize that this technology is going to take off, uh, but there's a lot of people that are trying to, uh, to, to the number of forks, for example, on Docker uh, are a clear indication of this. There's a lot of people that are trying to, to attach themselves to that wagon. So what, what really takes hold and becomes the standard across the community, I don't think anyone can comment on yet. Yeah? You said earlier that you use this, and maybe I'm just getting confused, but you said you use this in your uh, exploration of like what are going to some industrial controls, hardening, things like that. Is it more for... Uh, Trying to exploit those or for actual hardware? Uh, so I, I mentioned early on that I work uh, in the area of embedded systems and the, the Internet of Things. Um, often, what I, you know, a, as I look within those environments, uh, as I mentioned before, you, you get to a point where you, you want to be able to create something very quickly. Uh, uh, that sort of emulates a particular uh, a particular uh, uh, system that you've encountered. So I'm largely, from that standpoint, looking at this from a, a defensive perspective, right? I may do a penetration test, um, but it, it's largely because I want to make sure that something's configured correctly, or I just don't want to. Uh, I just want to understand what this this operating what this operating environment looks like because I might not be familiar with it. I'll also say that I use Docker a lot personally now. In the case, like I gave the example before of, of the CDC, right? People will come to me, and uh, I used to work for a long time as a penetration tester. So people will come to me and, and ask questions regarding uh, a, a particular uh, uh, vulnerability analysis. I don't know much about that area, but I'm willing to tackle it. So I, but I need to be able to quickly provision that environment and get it up and running right away. So there's where I've used it more offensively. Other questions? Yeah. As far as, uh, I'm curious, you know, the question that we were asking earlier about networking and such and you know, deploying bids or things like that. And, you know, theoretically, it could be like using some shared resources that they could get with the host OS or, or however you want to call it. Like, would you be able to monitor some of that, uh, like locally even? Would, that, would there be some benefit, like, if you wanted to? Because, I mean, that's one of the challenges with the yeah. virtual environment is if you spin off 10 or 15 machines to simulate something or, you know, an application or something like that, you have, like what they were talking about, uh, one of the people we were talking about earlier, you've got to, like, buy licenses for all those things and everything else. To some degree, like, you could possibly even just monitor all this, because I think, like you mentioned, it's opening up a socket locally or something like that to communicate over. I mean, is it theoretically you just monitor on your host and watch those sockets, or would it? Uh, you could probably do that. I haven't explored that area much. Yeah. 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 You should be able to, yeah. Yeah, with the chat for the, uh, for the uh, between Postgre and, uh, and web. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that sometimes some applications will just straight up break when you try to do that, but I mean, I'm just curious if, if well, I mean, yeah. if you're thinking out loud, then that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've never, I've never, ex I've never explored that, right? C primarily, right? I, I mentioned I'm a researcher, so, you know, you uh, there's plenty of other people that do the the daily fight here. Uh, what I what I would do in terms of intrusion detection technology uh, is research new types of of analytic techniques, right? I'm not concerned necessarily with, all right, well, how am I going to deploy this? So I, I haven't explored that, but I, I my my suspicion is that that's very possible. Well, I'd be curious too because.
it's the issue is the overhead cluster that you have to have to be able yeah. to keep it because you're pretty much replicating the traffic into memory and forth, you know, to, to do it. Yeah, and I don't. But I'd be curious if like that would that would be a way that you kind of have like containerized systems that you can still monitor centrally without necessarily having to have as much uh, that you could theoretically do in a cloud environment theoretically. Ben, did you have a question before we break up? I was going to ask, um, so, okay, I've built up my bundle with all my uh, containers, and now I want to share it back yep. to someone. Do I share just like the script to build it, or do I just share the whole? It really depends on your environment. So you could even push all the way back to Docker, the Docker hub, okay. um, and share it that way. You could just push your image to your internal Docker registry. Um, so, in the case of work, that's usually what we do. It's like, okay, I got this all up and running here. Pull it, and you'll get your your uh, your image. Or you could share the scripts. Typically, you just share the image because, as I mentioned before, it's very easy to do revisions on the image. So when I do another pull, it's just like get. I'm just pulling the changes. I don't right. I'm not. I don't have to. It's not like I have to uh, snapshot this VM and, and share it with uh, uh, the whole snapshot with another person. I just want to be able to quickly share. A, uh, uh, the revision. And, and the, the, all the modifications you make that have to make it blow like that, or can you like fire up your Docker and then like get into it to make customizations to add some things, tweak some things, and then and, and then you know take that layer, if you will. Good question. So, so you you can uh, uh, to your point, it doesn't have to be scripted out. And in fact, I mentioned earlier, I will typically put that container into an interactive mode when I'm debugging. So if I have the script, if I'm doing like trying to get an initial environment up and running with everything that I need and something keeps breaking and I don't know why, I'll say, oh, just give it to me in interactive. I'll debug it and figure out what's wrong. But once I get my, once I want to start putting on my applications, now I want to make sure that, okay, well, let me figure this out. Let me start to add things over time, right? The file system is, uh, is, is permanent, so if I, as I make changes, now I can get this to a point where, all right, now I, can, now I have my updated container, and now I, I want to do a push, and I'll share this with other people. Um, the, scripting, the scripting makes it easy from my perspective to, to, get the, to get a new environment up and running right away if you're pulling from standardized images. Last question. As far as, you know, like VMware and a lot of the virtual operating systems they have proprietary or you know maybe they're open source standards for like how like file systems work for example if those things obfuscate I, I take it that's kind of one of the differences like some of those shared resources are going to be things like base like a file system or something like that yeah those tend to be abstracted away um, and I'm trying to remember is it UFS that docker uses um, it has its I mean that so that's the underlying file system okay. but it's those, those file system yes okay. yes it doesn't but necessarily that's right. I, so I, I really appreciate it. These were very engaging questions. Thanks.